Hello everybody and welcome to our next exercise, another test on two population means, and this time a two-tailed test, and we're still going to make this assumption that sigma is unknown, but we're assuming that they are equal. Now that assumption is one that later on in module 11 we'll be able to test whether or not we have a reason to, to assume that they're either equal or, or not equal. For now, we're going to make that assumption, and it's going to make things a little bit easier for us. And you'll see what I mean when we don't make that assumption in the next problem, because the calculation for degrees of freedom is going to be quite tedious. So for now, this is a simplifying assumption that later on we'll learn how to test for. So let's get into this, um, into this problem, and we'll make sure that we can see just why it's a two-tailed test rather than just being told that it is. So university classes are becoming increasingly diverse with students moving from all parts of the planet to study in different, different countries. Imagine your statistics instructor gives you the following assignment. Measure the heights of the students in your classes and sort them by continent of origin. Perform a test to determine if the average height of students from North America is different than the average height of students from Europe. So, of course, you awkwardly go around asking all of your classmates how tall they are, and here's our data. Okay, so how do we know what kind of a test we're going to be doing? Our first step, of course, is to formulate the hypothesis. So, I put together my null and alternative, and I'm thinking is this lower tail, upper tail, or two tail test. So, we need to go back to really the, the wording of the problem, the wording of the assignment. What is it we're supposed to be doing? I'm measuring the heights of students. I'm performing a test to determine if the average height of students is different than the average height of students from Europe. There's that key word that's telling me what kind of test I'm doing. I'm only testing to see are they different or not. Not is, you know, European students at least as tall as, at least as short as, no taller than, right? Just are they different? And of course, we can also see that there's no hypothesized magnitude of a difference. You no, know, are they five inches? Uh, are they different by five inches or 10 inches or whatever? There's no specific magnitude of a difference. Only are they different. So, this is telling me that I have a two-tailed test with a hypothesized value of zero. Now, you might remember from the previous exercises when we are doing one-tailed test, and remember we talked about the importance of putting a little bit of care, a little bit of thought into how you define your terms. Because for a one-tailed test, the way that you define your terms, that really determined whether or not uh, an upper tail test was appropriate or a lower tail test was appropriate. It was very much reliant on how you defined your terms. For a two tail test, it really doesn't change much. So I'm just going to go from order in which I read them from left to right. And I'll call this my European and there's my North American. I'll show you at the end of this problem how this is going to change. Spoiler alert. It just turns it from a positive to a negative, our test statistic. It's not going to change anything of significance. Okay, so there's my test. We're going to test this at the 05 level of significance. Everybody remembers what that means. We've gone through a lot of practice problems. Hopefully, hopefully we haven't forgotten the basics. That implies that I am comfortable with a 5% chance of committing a type 1 error, right? That level of significance measures my comfort level with committing a type 1 error, that is, rejecting a true null hypothesis. Now, of course, I tell my students that when you're formulating a test, especially one that has a hypothesized difference of zero, feel free to write it like this. And, and just kind of get rid of that zero because it's implied when we write it like this. I'm just moving the other um, population to the other side. You know, personally, again, it's a preference. I just find that writing it like this may be a little bit easier to read it 
um, rather than this. But really it is a preference. Either one of these should be considered correct. So justification, okay, I formulated my test like this so that if the evidence supports the null hypotheses, I have no reason to believe that there is any statistically significant difference between the average height of Europeans and North Americans. If our evidence supports the alternative hypotheses, now I have evidence to show that there is a statistically significant difference in the average height between North Americans and Europeans. Okay, so that's why I've formulated it like this. Now we want our test statistic. So now the process, again, you know, you guys should be seeing the process here is very, very, very similar. Formulate the test, calculate the test statistic. Of course, this is where, this is where that assumption about the equality of the variances is going to come into effect. Because now what we need is this pooled estimator of that population variance. Because, again, if, if we're assuming sigma 1 is equal to sigma 2, again, we're not assuming we know what they are. We're assuming that whatever they are, they're the same. So they're equal to some common but unknown population variance. Well, then we need an estimate of that unknown population standard deviation or population variance. And so that's what this pooled estimator is. And that pooled estimator is a relatively straightforward calculation. Now, I know earlier I said making this assumption about the equality of variances simplifies things. And yet here I'm showing you this additional calculation that needs to be done. Believe me, this additional calculation that needs to be done is still simpler than if we assume unequal variances. You'll see the, the ugliest formula that you will have seen up until this point in these, in these videos. So this pooled estimator is just n1 minus 1 and that first variance plus and 2 minus 1 times that second divided by n1 and 2 minus 2. Just a really quick little aside. Just so you guys can see what's happening here. If I look at just one of those calculations, remember, so we're looking at n2 minus 1 times s squared. But remember, what, what is that sample variance? Well, that sample variance that's just looking at all of those deviations from that mean squared divided by its sample size minus one, right? So each of those terms in the numerator, we're multiplying by that n minus one. It just cancels that out. So what we're left in the numerator of this calculation is just the sums of squared deviations from both of those samples. And then we're dividing it by the corresponding degrees of freedom. Anyways, that's just a little aside, just so you maybe have some idea of what's happening in that calculation. So let's go ahead and um, put our numbers in. So my sample sizes are 33 and 41. And my variances, 5.3, those are not variances. Those are standard deviations, 5.3 and 3.3. Why does that matter? Because I'm given standard deviations, so I have to make sure that I square those. If you're given variances, then it's already squared. Don't square it again. I'm given the standard deviation, so here I have to make sure that I square those. And I divide it by my samples 33 plus 41 minus 2 as my degrees of freedom. And this is going to give me, let's go quickly, 32 times 5.3 squared plus 40 times 3.3 squared divided by 33.41 minus 2. That gives me 18.5 
three, five, three, four. Might as well carry a third with us just to be safe. Okay, so that's our pooled estimator. So now I can come back and finish our calculation here. We have our sample sizes are 70 minus 68. That hypothesized difference is zero. I'm just putting it in there just to be complete, to be thorough. I know it doesn't really change anything. And here's where I need that pooled estimator was 18.534. And this is one over our sample sizes. That was 41. And so this is going to give me, let's see, 2 divided by square root of all of this. And that gives me 1.986. I think this is going to give us an interesting result. So there's my test statistic, 1.986. Now, there's actually a reason why I'm, I'm keeping that to three decimal places, and you'll see why in just, in just one second. So there's our test statistic. Next step, it's all very much the same. We're doing both, uh, let's see, the p-value approach and the critical value approach. So we need our degrees of freedom, always, when working with the t-distribution. So our degrees of freedom here, again, they're always the degrees of freedom that correspond with our estimate of the variance. Our estimate of the variance, again, we're assuming they're equal. There's our estimate of, well, my notation here is showing standard deviation, but that's the same as the estimate of our variance. So our degrees of freedom always correspond with the estimate of the variance. And so here I have degrees of freedom 72. Does it really matter to be precise? Not so much when we're doing these calculations by hand. When you're on a computer, it's not an issue. But when we're doing this by hand, I have degrees of freedom of 72. Okay, so I'm going to go down to my t distribute. Let's do the p value approach first. And so I'm looking at my degrees of freedom here, and I'm looking for 72. And what do I see? Oops, that's not what I wanted to do. Well, 72 is not there, right? So we don't have to be perfectly accurate, especially when we're doing these by hand, because the tables that we have rarely have enough detail. So I'm going to pick the closest, which is going to be 80. And I'm looking for my test statistic, which is 1.986. Now, this is why I kept it to three decimal places, just so that we can see that it is, in fact, just a little bit less. Had I rounded it to two decimal places, I would have been right spot on. So I kept it to three decimal places just so that I can see that it's not exactly 1.99. I'm a little bit below 1.99. And so I'm going to come up here. And there's my two relevant probabilities, okay? So between 0.05 and 0.025. So I'm going to write out my p-value is less than 0.05, more than 0.025. How do you feel about that result? You look at the test, you say, oh, the test is at alpha 0.05, and you say p-value is less than 0.05, and right away you want to reject. I know, and there's people watching this video right now that you're saying, oh, you made a mistake, you moron, that's not right. And then you click and you watch another video of somebody who knows what they're doing. This is a really common mistake. Right, especially when you know if you're doing an assignment, you've got a time constraint or an exam or something like this, and you're you're under a lot of pressure and you're just kind of rushing through these. Because as you've probably seen by now, the process of hypothesis testing is so similar for all of the different types of tests that we have done. 
that students get into a routine, you get into a habit, you just kind of go through habitually and you go down, you find your degrees of freedom, you look at your test statistic, bang, there's my probabilities, okay, it's less than alpha, reject. Yes, there's a lot of similarities. But don't forget those small but important differences because sometimes they can be really crucial, like in this one here. We've done exercises before where when we forget to double the probability to get our p-value, it doesn't actually change anything because maybe the probability that I look up is already greater than my alpha, and so I choose to not reject them. You know, no harm done by not forgetting to, or by forgetting to double, maybe it doesn't change anything. But in this case, forgetting to multiply it by two changes my conclusion and then changes everything that happens afterwards. So my p-value here certainly is not between 0 0.025 and 0 0.05. My p-value is less than 0.1 is greater than 0.05. Now I can see it is greater than my level of significance. Do not reject. We have insufficient evidence now to reject that null hypothesis. Okay, And using the critical value approach as well, again with alpha divided by 2, because it's a two-tailed test, Here's that alpha divided by 2, right, 0 0.025. There I find my critical value is that 1.99. And again, that's 80 degrees of freedom because we don't have 72, so I'm, I'm using 80 as an approximation. So both of those the p-value approach and the critical value approach both bring us to the same conclusion. And again, we'll draw a little picture. Right here is that positive 199. Of course, it's a two-tailed test, so I actually have a positive and a negative critical value. Our test statistic here was very close, 1.986. Well, it's not in our rejection space. It is, albeit very close, in our do not reject space. So both of the approaches, the critical value approach and the p-value approach, bring us to the same conclusion as they should. We have insufficient evidence to reject the null hypotheses we are unable to show that there is any statistically significant difference in the average height between the European students and the North American students. Okay, so, so that's it. Again, you can see how there's so much similarity in this process, but be very careful about those small little differences. Now, I promised you that I would show you how this would change if we switched our definitions of the terms. So if, oops, if I had set this up as North Americans as number one and Europeans as number two, what would have changed? Well, looking at our test statistic over here, this would have been 68 minus 70. That pooled estimator is not affected. That standard error, therefore, is not affected which means the only thing that would be different is that our test statistic would be negative. Coming down here, we would have then that negative test statistic that would have been right here, negative 1.986. Once again, it still would have been in our do not reject because down there, we only reject if it's smaller than that critical value. So again, it's not really consequential um, how you define your terms for a two-tailed test. It's really just something you have to put some care into for a one-tailed test. For a two-tailed test, you'll get exactly the same conclusion. Okay, so that is about it. I hope that this was helpful. I thank you all for watching. The next problem that we're going to do 
we're going to do away with this assumption. We're going to assume unequal. And that's going to change things for the worse. And you'll see. Okay, everybody. Thanks for watching.